to have the opportunity to introduce you to Charles Simon. Charles is founder and CEO of Future AI, who are very kindly sponsoring today's conference. Um, Charles Simon is going to share his unique insights on AI, AGI, and creativity. His background in electrical engineering, computer science, and neurosciences give him a singular viewpoint. Having observed and participated in AI development since the earliest neural network conferences, he's also able to add a historical perspective. Founder and CEO of Future AI, developing software which will form the necessary components of an AGI future, including the open source Brain Simulator 2. He, many of you will have seen his demo, his exciting software over the last couple of days, and um, we've been having really a wonderful time with some great discussions with Charles. So I'm very delighted to welcome Charles on stage at AGI 22 in Seattle. Thank you. So you come out on the stage like this and, and they've always got a slide with your name on it. And you think that that's for the uh, audience benefit, but it's actually so I can say, oh yeah, that's what I came out here to talk in. And, uh, and the clicker works and everything. And I'm still Charles Simon on this slide, founder of uh, Future AI. And I'm gonna talk to you about a number of things that we're doing. That's news. There, there, there. Okay, great. But AGI to me is the most exciting project on the planet because not only do we get to do a bunch of cool stuff with computers, but we get to probe the mysteries of the mind, a question that we've been addressing for millennia. And of course, this has always been the holy grail of computer science since I guess the 1950s. And with a little luck, we'll be able to save the world. And that's a combination that you seldom get in a project that you get to work on. And so today I wanna to talk about creativity and a little bit about what it would take to create an AGI. And the way I'm gonna approach that is to scope the size of the project. And you know, there are estimates of it's gonna be a hundred years or it's gonna be next year or whatever. And I fall on the earlier, area of that spectrum and I want to explain why that is. And along the way, in order to get you to believe me, I need to propose some sort of structure for AGI. And uh, here we got an auto advance on a slide that I wasn't quite prepared for. And then I'm gonna talk about the conclusions that you can reach from this proposed structure because it's not, uh, it's not the classic AGI structure. So hopefully you'll be able to see some things that you haven't heard already a, a hundred times in this uh, conference. But uh, creativity, of course, the original creative idea was you put a hundred or a thousand monkeys in a room with a thousand typewriters and they type away and they will eventually type all the works of Shakespeare. And I've got this image in my mind of Shakespeare standing, reading this stuff saying, gibberish, 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 nonsense, gibberish, gibberish, nonsense. To be or not to be, hey, this is hot. But the creativity, of course, isn't in the monkeys and it isn't in the typewriters. The creativity is mostly in our friend Bill and to some extent, the guys who, who, the guys who had the idea to get all of these monkeys and put them in the room and buy the typewriters, that's a big part of the creativity. And of course, you've seen already in this show a lot of doll E pictures, and I've got mine. This is, I put in the words creativity as, as, at its best, and this is what I got. And uh, I thought this was pretty good, but we've seen a lot of doll E pictures. But again, the creativity is in the guy who wrote the program or the team that wrote the program. This is, by the way, out of crayon. And uh, if you haven't been to that website, it's a lot of fun. You can put in the words and it'll draw the pictures. Uh, but the creativity is in the guys that write the program and in you selecting which picture you wanna keep and which you wanna discard. The same is true for GPT-3. And in this case, it's been asked to write a poem. And from my perspective, this isn't a very good poem, but maybe it's a better po pro poem than I was gonna write. So who am I to, to complain about it? But, um, We've had a lot of talk about that, but I wanna give you a creative assignment. 
mentally to say, create a rhyme on this image, and then we'll talk about, well, what did it take to do that? And you might say, a fat cat ate a rat. You might say, taint fitten for a kitten to eat a mitten. Uh, if you were in Spanish, you might say, mato un gato con nitrato. Uh, Google Translate says that I kill a cat with nitrate. I don't have much Spanish myself. But now you think about what it would take to have an AGI do such a program and the first, such a, such a problem. And the first thing you do is you start breaking the problem down into its components. And you say, well, I need some sort of image recognition. And of course, I want to be able to recognize an image like this, which of course doesn't have anything to do with a photograph of a cat. This is a, a, you know, a sketch that kind of captures essence of cat. And thus far, although we've got great image recognition programs, they're not really very good at capturing the essence of something. Um, and I could ask you, is the cat happy? Looks pretty happy to me. So you're gonna wanna write some sort of cheerful poetry. We're gonna need some sort of system for understanding the sounds of words in order to make some uh, rhyming. We're gonna have to have a system that understands the uh, syntax. So I make something that makes a little bit of sense, even though a uh, fat cat ate a rat doesn't make a lot of sense. And then you're gonna need the uh, system to decide what it is. And of course, all of this is based uh, in a context because you might write a different kind of a rhyme if you were standing up in front of people at an AGI 22 conference. If you were writing for the locker room, maybe you'd create a limerick and it would have a li little bit different flavor. And, jeez, uh, auto advance, the curse of the PowerPoint. And, uh, you go down this road and you've collected these ideas and you're gonna come up with a narrow kind of AI program and it might work really well for this specific application. You've made very little progress towards AGI. And so what I wanna do is to kind of broaden the concept and think about, well, what is overall general intelligence and try and get ourselves out of the pickle of creating uh, many, many narrow projects and hoping that at some point in the future they grow together because although they might, and I don't say it's impossible, they haven't so far. And I'm hopeful that we'll put together a, an architecture that will form a basis for a kind of a universal intelligence. So now we're gonna talk about, well, how big is the problem of creating AGI? And I want to address that from a number of different perspectives of which you got this preview of the jacquard loom. And this, the jacquard loom, how many of you are familiar with the jacquard loom? Okay, the jacquard loom is a very first programmable device. And it had these punched cards and the punched cards would control the mechanism of which threads were raised and lowered while the weaver was just running the thread back and forth through it. And so the punched cards would define the pattern that was going to be produced in the fabric that was coming out. And so the input, of course, was a punched card. The output was the uh, woven pattern. The program size, and I'm just looking at the size of the cards and the approximate number of holes I can see and say, well, that's probably thousands of bytes of information. And of course, now we've gone on to the world of the computer where the input is a program. The output can be almost anything. Of course, you also get uh, auxiliary input coming into the side of this, not just the program, but you did in the loom too, because the weaver got to choose the color of the, the uh, thread, et cetera. But in the program, <clears throat> in the program of the computer, this program size can be gigabytes. We're now to a point where you can put together a team of software engineers and produce massive, massive programs. But you don't usually think about this, but in a similar vein, you can grab human DNA, 
put it into the appropriate kind of a human cell, and out pops a person. And this person not only has a human body and a human structure, he's got a human intelligence, at least the starting of a human intelligence. And the total program size of the DNA, 750 megabytes. And when the Human Genome Project was getting started, this was an unfathomably large amount of data. Well, now you can put it in a small corner of a thumb drive, so it's no big deal. And yesterday I asked John Cadwell, well, how much of that? Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Well, come on, baby. There we go. Maybe this will wait for me. How much of that 750 megabytes of data is actually controlling the structure of the brain? And the answer is, we don't know. And one of the reasons we don't know is that the structure of almost any human part is largely dependent on its chemistry. And then there's also this structure. And we have a much better idea of how DNA goes to chemistry than we have about how it goes to structure. But obviously, somehow the DNA defines what the structure of a person is. And part of that defines the structure of the brain. And we'll talk about the structure of the neocortex, which is what we think with, we think. And maybe that represents only 1% of that DNA, maybe 10%. We really have no way of knowing at this point. But that means that we might be able to define a complete AGI in a program as small as seven and a half megabytes. And seven and a half megabytes is a program that's well within the scope of a team to write in a couple of years. It's really not that big a deal anymore to write a program of that size. And I want you also to consider that a horse with, a, with significantly less DNA has many capabilities at birth that humans don't have. The horse that's newborn can stand up and walk and see and see obstacles and not run into obstacles. And if you've ever gone down the road of trying to write a program that does that, you know it is a big deal. And so you also know that DNA somehow is capable of defining the neural structure that allows that to be taking, taking place. So the AGI problem, as I see it, is one of, well, what are we going to write? We just don't know what to write in our seven and a half megabyte data set. And we have, we have no problem with how massive the program is going to be because it's not going to be that massive. And we don't really have a problem of how fast or vast the computer is going to be that's going to run this program. And I'll talk more about that a little later in the slide deck if I can only get there. So the question is what to write. Suppose you knew exactly what to write to make an exact human brain. And so imagine you spend two years coding it and then you start training it. And if it's exactly like a human, after three years of training, it's have, gonna have the capabilities of a three-year-old. Now I like three-year-olds as much as the next person, but they are not particularly marketable, at least in our society. And, uh, so we're going to have to wait longer to get some more general intelligence into this person so we can make some more use of it. And we can expect maybe 20 more years of training and experience to get somebody who's really going to be useful and generally intelligent. And we guys, we just don't want to wait 25 years to find out if our idea was correct. So we're going to take a bunch of software shortcuts and I'll itemize some of them. And it's kind of interesting that we started when I was an undergraduate, there was a big push to create chess playing programs. And there were a lot of people that believed that if we could solve a chess playing program and write a good pro, a pro, a, excuse me, a program that would play a good game of chess, that the rest of general intelligence was gonna be easy. And that turned out not to be the case. And this is codified now as more of X paradox where the capabilities of an adult are much easier to program than the capabilities of a one-year-old. So we're gonna be looking for a lot of software shortcuts. We've got a lot of capabilities, a lot of possible approaches to uh, AGI, and I'm gonna show you what mine is. 
And my approach is to say, let's go back to the only actual general intelligence we know about. We're gonna talk about the brain. We'll look at the neuron. And I wrote the brain simulator so I could simulate a bunch of neurons and learn what sorts of things you could do with neurons. And the brain is largely constructed, you know, largely split into three general areas. And some of these numbers are gonna be important, so I'll ask you to remember them. The brain stem is full of auto autonomic functions. We don't think that it learns. We think it's hard coded because nobody seems to have to take the time to learn to get their heart to beat or to learn how to breathe. That seems to be hard coded. The cerebellum, back here, back of your brain, kind of underneath, is believed to be responsible for coordination and muscular coordination so I can talk and walk at the same time. And 56 billion neurons, about two thirds of the brain is in terms of neuron count, but not nearly in terms of volume, is in, involved in coordinating muscles and learning sequences of actions. And so for example, if you were to learn to play the piano and you practice over and over and over, that area of your brain learns by, learns by repetition. And the neocortex, the whole top of your brain, is what we believe is the thinking part of your brain. It's only 16 billion neurons. You got to take only 16 billion with a grain of salt. And it learns by a whole different uh, holds a number of different mechanisms. But it's kind of interesting that the brain is largely split fore and aft, the neocortex split more fore and aft, that all of the sensory stuff, stuff for the most part comes into the back of your brain. You've got uh, visual cortex and auditory cortex, et cetera. And the forward part of your brain is involved in planning what to do and doing it. And this is a very rough cut, but uh, bear with me on it because uh, we don't want to get too far into the details. But uh, so, for example, the part of your brain that recognizes speech is back here in the sensory zone, and the part that generates speech is up here in the action zone. And right across this area are the uh, uh, motor cortexes that control all of the voluntary actions and the sensory cortex that controls, that receives all of the touch and pain sensors from your brain. So looking a little deeper, let's look at an individual neuron. And of course, as I say, there are billions of them. And so they are hooked together in a big network. And we have these wonderful graphics now that we can do. But the individual neuron generates a spike. And the spike, travel, the spike travels down the axon, goes to the synapses, connects to other, uh, the, uh, the other neurons that it's connected to, and transmits a signal. And of course, I'm making a, a grand oversimplification because like all biology, things are much more complex than they, they appear at first. But the uh, signal travels down the axon at a leisurely approximately one meter per second. This is not an electrical signal. It's a kind of a chain reaction of ions going from place to place. And so the neuron itself is an extremely slow device. And here's what you learn. If you play with neurons in a simulator for a couple of years, you learn what neurons are really good at and what they're not so good at. They're really good at signal differentiation. Uh, for example, in your eye, you can detect boundaries of various colors or brightnesses with considerable accuracy. And you can, this is looking at adjacent neurons and considering their firing rates as being slightly different. And you can do that with a lot more accuracy than you can know the absolute firing rate of any neuron. And this is a source of a number of very interesting kind of optical illusions. Um, Similarly, you can detect the arrival time of multiple signals, and you use this for 
directional sound. And for example, uh, sound coming from over here will come to this ear about half a millisecond before this ear. And in your brain, you can do that quite, quite effectively. In fact, the auditory people tell me that I can detect the direction of sound with accurately in front of me to the accuracy of about 10 degrees. And this rec represents deltas in arrival time of as little as 10 microseconds. It's amazing how, how accurate this can be. But I want to uh, point out on the downside, well, we're still up and so you can have short term memory in neuron firing or in the charge storage in a in a neuron and I'm talking about really short term memory, a memory that you can establish with a single spike. You don't have to do any synapse adjustment, you can store something for a short period of time in the state of a neuron and have it happen instantly long term memory in synapses. The neat thing about synapses is that they can store memory in the configuration, the physical layout of the ions and the synapse. And this requires essentially no energy to store indefinitely. And so you can learn things now and set them up into the configuration of the weights of your synapses and store it indefinitely without burning any energy doing so. As opposed to neurons, if you want to fire a neuron, that does take energy. And so anything you're going to store in a neuron firing rate or in the charge of a neuron is going to take some energy to maintain. Okay, now we're on to the, to the picture that I wanted to show that the slide, the neurons are really, really slow. And here we're talking about time frames of four milliseconds. Now, when I was an undergraduate, a bunch of this was in the time when uh, when telephone switching was becoming solid state. And we had all of these telephone relays that you could get for dirt cheap. And we built a CPU out of telephone relays. Telephone relay switches in 12 milliseconds. 12 milliseconds is only three times slower than this speed. And you can get faster telephone relays. So when you're thinking about how the brain works in terms of its speed, we're thinking of 1950s telephone relays. The brain, the neurons in your brain are so slow, this has a dramatic impact on the kinds of structures that might possibly be created. Likewise, we talk about the synapses and you typically will see, you can set the synapse weight with this nice orange curve. And this is called heavy in learning. And then you look at the underlying data and there's all of this scatter, which says to me that it's essentially impossible to set a specific synapse to a specific weight in a short period of time. Essentially, in order to set a specific weight, you're gonna to have to tweak and adjust and this and that because a single spike is not gonna be doing it for you. And what that means, these slowness and these weight problems mean that you cannot represent very many distinct values. Because if you, for example, want a firing rate of a neuron to represent a value between zero and 10, you're gonna to have to have some amount of time in order to represent that value. And the more different values you wanna represent, the slower your system is gonna run. And the neuron is so slow to start with that to represent 100 different values is gonna make it uh, uselessly slower. What that means because of that, machine learning is not particularly viable in biological neurons. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And neurons are particularly bad at storing sequential information. And so this might be the most useful part of this presentation, you can write down this phone number. This is the phone number to the White House. You can phone that number and complain about anything you want. Uh, but you might think that you want to recite this phone number, you have a bunch of neurons representing the digits, and then you have a neuron or a cluster of neurons representing this, and you're going to fire this neuron, and these are all going to fire. And the problem is, if you just do this, 
all of these neurons are gonna fire at the, essentially the same time. And it's very difficult to think about sequential information without a structure that looks more like this. And you get these sequencers or chains of neurons and you have to have two neurons for every step in the chain if you want to be able to control the speed of the playback. And so, example, for example, if I wanted to say 202 or 202, that's a lot of different sequential neuron firings. And so you end up just storing sequential data like that. And this leads me to graphs. And for those of you who haven't been down this road, a graph is a collection of nodes connected by edges. And for example, you can represent the statement, yellow is a color. And the arrow in this case has a, the, it, it has an arrowhead indicating a direction because that means that color is not a yellow. You gotta know what direction the link is, but in a graph in general, you can follow the, the links in both directions. So I can say, name some colors and you can say yellow. Graph can be a lot of stuff. And you see all of these pictures with circles and lines and stuff. Uh, you can make a lot of graphs, do things you want. And one of the most common in AI is called a knowledge graph. And I'll talk about that. Uh, it also goes as a semantic network. There may be some subtle distinction that I'm not sure about. The neural network could be a graph. Anything you want can be a graph. Your brain could be a, rep a graph with neurons representing the nodes and synapses representing the edges. A computer program could be a graph, which means that uh, you could build a, a, a graph with the program that defines the graph as its content and have a very interesting philosophical conversation about that. And we know that there has to be some amount of data area in your brain that is a graph because you can know that red, that yellow is a color and blue is a color. And from that, I can say, name some colors and you can say yellow and blue. Okay, you already knew that, that's not special. But now, how many of you are in computer science? Okay, quite a few. So you've all seen examples with foo and bar. I can tell you that foo is a color and bar is a color. And now you can say, name some colors and you can say yellow, foo and bar. I trained your mind with a single instance of information and you knew the reverse of that information instantly. And that says to me that there's gotta be a graph. In fact, we could talk about foo as a color and bar as a color for quite a while. And if I say that, you might actually remember that foo is a color and bar is a color, especially now that I've said it three times. And you probably can't remember the phone number because phone numbers are sequential and that's a lot tougher. So the question is not whether or not there's a graph, but whether it's a small graph and a lot of other stuff or a big graph and a little bit of other stuff. Of course, you gotta have the actions and inputs and sensory and other stuff in addition, but that's the same regardless of the graph amount here. Well, let's ask, well, suppose your entire neocortex was a graph. And what we wanna ask about is, so uh, you go to the neuron simulator and you say, this is what it would take to build graph nodes. and Essentially, you can build as many nodes as you want in the simulator. And in a minimal requirement, I could build a graph with eight neurons per node. And you can't use one neuron per node because synapses are one directional. And I already told you in the previous slide that you got to be able to traverse this information bidirectionally in order for it to be useful. So the minimum I could come up with was eight neurons per node plus an additional two neurons for every edge type you want. And I only program, programmed up two edge types, but uh, you can add as many as you want. And a problem with this design is the failure of any single neuron or any single synapse will cause the system to fail. And we know that the brain is highly redundant and highly 
capable of surviving various kinds of failures. Neurons fail all the time and they don't seem to bother you very much. And so this implies, let's give a rough estimate that it's a hundred neurons per node because that gives you not only some redundancy, but it gives you the ability to track how recently a node was used. So you know when to forget and things like that. And if you do a little bit of division, if there are only 16 billion neurons, and I say only advisedly, 16 billion neurons in your neocortex, that says that you've got a maximum of 160 million nodes. And that may sound like a lot, but Wikidata is a knowledge graph. It's got about 100 million nodes and a billion edges, and it contains a ton more information than my mind. Now, my mind does store some stuff that is not in Wikidata, but I'll show you Wikidata in a slide or two here. But if we're talking about a system of 160 million nodes, I can put that on a desktop computer. That doesn't require supercomputers and the largest computers in the world. It's just not that big a deal. So the only things you can do in a graph, graphs are pretty simple. You can add, delete, and modify nodes. You can add, delete, and modify edges. And then the key is that you can search it millions of ways. And in the brain, it's likely that there are not very many ways that you can search, but a lot of redundancy. So this is what a node looks like in Wikidata. This is the node for yellow. And all of this is the data that's actually in the node. And then what they call statements like yellow is a color. Those are uh, go on for pages. And this highlights a distinction between the knowledge graph and the information that's in your brain. In a knowledge graph, when you put in some information, you assume that it's correct and you want to keep it a long time. In your brain, you got this constant flood of incoming information. And uh, you, in order to do things like well, now I know that the audience is behind me and now I know you're in front of me. To do transformations like that, you've got to have a lot of short-term memory and you've got to be able to store a lot of things for a very short period of time and you have to forget what's, what proves not to be useful. And so it's a kind of a difference in strategy. You need to have real-time information and here's the real bugger, in your brain, the nodes and edges cannot contain any data directly. If they did, our understanding of the brain would be entirely different. We'd open up the skull and we'd see all of these labels and we'd see that the, the mythical neurons flash whenever they fired and you'd know how the brain was laid out. But in the brain, we're pretty sure there aren't any Unicode strings. There aren't any floating point numbers and there aren't any images in the, as such. But you end up with an abstract kind of a mechanism like this. Let's say this is the abstract node representing yellow. And yellow is a color where there's some sort of abstract node representing color. And if you see something yellow, it will fire this abstract node of yellow. And it connects to things that are yellow that have lots of other nodes. You have a mental model that shows where you might have a couple of bananas in your field of knowledge. And then you get to words and the words that represent yellow, you might use the word yellow or the word amarillo or the word gelp or the word coward could mean a lot of things. You can have a lot of words associated with something and remember you have no data so you don't know what these words are either. And so we'll look at this one and we'll say, a word must have at least a pronunciation. And if you can read, it's gotta have a spelling. And so you have to have one of these sequencers like for the, uh, for the phone number because pronunciation has to be sequential because I can say yellow or I can say yellow. And uh, this information is used in an incoming auditory cortex so that you can understand the word when you hear it. 
So you have to have this information and this will percolate up and fire the abstract node yellow. You've got to be able to run it the other way. So you can, this will pipe out to your cerebellum and you'll go through the complex mechanism of perhaps hundreds of muscle contractions to be able to say the word. And then of course, if you can read, now we have the spelling for the word. And for each of the letters that you can spell, you've got to have the visual input for the word. And you can all, I put in Y, y and E, so you get an idea that you've got three segments for a Y and four segments for the E, and maybe you've got some sort of mechanism for remembering that. And then you want to be able to output this information. So the Y might be keyboarded, it might be written by hand, and when you stop to think about it, when you're taking notes, you don't really pay attention to whether you're writing or typing. It's just fully automatic. You think your thought and it comes out and it goes to the paper. You don't have to pay attention. But we can also look at each of these letters as being an abstract node in its own right with a word which you can say like Y and it has a pronunciation Y. And so you can see that in your brain, you've got this network of stuff and you don't know what any of it means except by context. And so you've got all of this context and context is everything because the nodes themselves don't have labels. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of the software shortcuts that we can have like handling sequential information. In a computer, all the information is inherently sequential. You can't store something in a computer without an address and the address has implications of data that came before and other data that comes later. Um, another sh shortcut is 3D vision. You can have with your two eyes, you can look out at something and estimate in your mind how far away it is. And you do that with millions of neurons and I can do it with a computer in a couple of lines of trig, and it runs a whole bunch faster than it can possibly run in your brain. Uh, I wanted to talk about the robot coordination, and I never miss an opportunity to add this uh, Boston Dynamics uh, video clip because it's so popular. But the key to think, think about is that it gets this wonderful fluid motion, which essentially replaces the 56 billion neurons of your cerebellum and it does it without thinking about neurons because the guys that write the program know about forces and physics and feedback and they can do that in a couple of microprocessors. And so the idea that you need a supercomputer in order to emulate all of the neurons and synapses in a brain is simply unrealistic because you can take all of these shortcuts and eliminate vast quantities of stuff and get past it. Of course, we can represent our graph in software structures instead of in neurons, and that's a whole lot more efficient because we've got lists and structures and hash tables and can do all kinds of good stuff. And we can put labels and values in our nodes, and so, we don't have to go through that whole rigmarole that I just showed you of figuring out what yellow means because we can just write yellow in the, in the uh, header of the node and know how to spell it and know how to say it, et cetera. Machine learning. We can use machine learning where we haven't figured out how to answer a problem. And uh, uh, some people think that I'm not particularly in favor of machine learning and the truth is that if, if I'm willing to use trig to do uh, three-dimensional calculation, I can't fault somebody for using machine learning to do some sort of a visual interpretation. It's all just a software shortcut that may or may not have anything to do with the way your brain works, but accomplishes a similar task. And finally, I said, well, we got a maximum of 160 million nodes, but I don't know how many nodes it really takes to be generally intelligent. Maybe I can build a system with a million nodes that's smart enough to work at McDonald's. 
ask me in a year. I'll have a much better idea on that one. So where does all of this lead me? Well, the amount of programming you got to write for AGI seems like it's going to be manageable as soon as we figure out what it is, and that could be happening at any time. The size of the data that you need to represent is manageable. The hardware already exists to handle networks of hundreds of millions of nodes. That's not a problem. We've got all of these software shortcuts that we'll be able to take, again, as soon as we figure out what the AGI program really is. And then we'll get to the process of how we're gonna create it. AGI emergence is going to be gradual. And the reason that it's gonna be gradual is every time we start to approach AGI, we get some AGI-ish kind of a capability that is marketable in its own right. So I produce something that has an improvement in the way your Alexa understands you and everybody's gonna love that. And somebody else produces something that's got better vision that they can use on a self-driving car and everybody's gonna love that. And as we approach actual human level intelligence, everybody's gonna love it because all of these little pieces are gonna be marketable. And the more we attach them to each other and the more they can interact and have their context, the better things are going to be. And finally, as we approach human level intelligence, nobody's gonna notice. And at some point we're gonna get close to the threshold and then we're gonna equal the threshold and then we're gonna exceed the threshold. And at some point thereafter, we're gonna have machines that are obviously superior to human intelligence. And then people will begin to agree that yeah, maybe HEI exists, but it's not gonna be a specific time that happens at a specific place. And so the nut of this is that my overall conclusion, AGI is inevitable and possible and sooner than most people think, could be as little as a couple of years. This is a quick picture that I'll be happy to talk to you about, about our internal architecture. And I wanna thank you for your time. I want you to visit our behind the scenes, which today is just out in the, uh, out in the little restaurant outside the bar here that you can see our little robots running around and I'll be happy to show you our internal graph structure as it is. Uh, Robbie Robinson's presenting a neurally plausible graph structure for AGI and I'd like you to submit questions or if we have time, we can take some today. Right, I'm sure we have lots of questions for Charles after that riveting talk. Who, I'm gonna go online first. Alex, I believe you have a question for us online. Hi. Hello, uh, very interesting talk, Charles. I thought it's kind of interesting that you were looking at the brain architecture and I was particularly fascinated by your nodal representation with neurons. And so I work in the area of brain inspired stuff. I work in spiking neural nets and you did show uh, rate potential and the, the crossing of spikes, for example. So one, a couple of questions raised in my mind, and especially in your earlier neural implementations, which I actually do think need to be answered because I think learning without necessarily saying a machine learning approach is critical to address if you want the inevitable AGI. Uh, and again, that might be an interesting discussion if you disagree, but I do think getting the learning process is the hardest and perhaps most unstable part. So my question for you is, what was your learning type? You did show the STDP curve, so pardon me if I missed some detail. Um, did you rate code the neurons? Were you learning in pure spikes? Because if so, um, which would be more brain-like and efficient, it's extremely difficult to learn, especially time-varying data. I can't even imagine learning a graph system with spiking neurons, even though it could be done. Um, and then again, some other things, because uh, again, if you've heard of Spawn and Nango, that also has some tools, for example, when it comes to neural modeling. So did you do things like, how did you address the reward part with a basal ganglia? How did you deal with catastrophic forgetting? Because even spiking nets, they do exhibit this. So I was just curious to know about your learning process and did you really work in spikes or rate coded and how did you deal with reward signals and catastrophic forgetting? Sorry for, you can lump them all together is one super question.
Sorry. Okie dokie. No, okay. There. Okay. Let me address the question. I mean, you, you asked you asked a, a whole series of wonderful questions, and and uh, uh, let me address a couple of them. When I showed the little picture of the graph, and we had the horizontal rows that represent nodes, all of the diagonal synapses in the table represented uh, uh, Hebbian synapses, and they were what represented the connections of the uh, nodes to one another. And we have to presume that that you have a you know clusters of thousands of nodes that are fully interconnected, and by simple association of Hebbian uh, learning and Hebbian synapses, you can make any connections that you need to make. You need to have a memory controller sort of a system. And let's just imagine that it's the hippocampus that does that for you, that will be able to, and I, I mean, speaking just with, without any uh, uh, experimental data to prove that, but, uh, you have to be able to do sequential things like you have to be able to make the node of parent to child, the connection from parent to child and the connection from child back to parent. You have to be able to create that. But if you are using a simply a heavy and model synapse, you can create that in fairly short order. Uh, and that was the model that we used in, in that process. And to some extent, having proven to ourselves that we could create a graph in spiking neurons, we then created a graph in, in a higher level language and didn't pursue the, the, the neurons much further because the neurons were, were difficult to work with in software. And slow, I imagine, too. It's very hard to simulate. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll save other questions for later. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Right, who, who in the audience has any questions for Charles? It's working now. Okay. Okay. You, you found a secret. Anyone in the audience, any questions for Charles? Has he just blown your mind? Yeah. Went here, thank you. Out of all the different modules that you're bringing into the brain simulator, what's the hardest one to incorporate? Um, you say modules or mod modules. modules? Modules. I saw that long list of modules you have integrated. Right. Well, um, let me back up for the, the for the the to, to bring everybody else up to a speed. The brain simulator is a spiking neural simulator that's got all of these neurons and synapses. And it also has the ability to create software modules that you can create, simply outline a rectangular set collection of neurons and say, when you get to this set of neurons, I want you to execute this high level code. And so you can do anything you want in the high level code. And uh, for example, we have the, the module that is the graph and we have the module that is a camera interface and another module that's a speech recognition interface that simply gets data from a microphone and pipes it out to uh, uh, pipes it out to Azure for speech recognition and by far the most difficult part of this process thus far has been maintenance of the mental model so I look at you and I see you here and now I'm facing this way and I have to know you're over there. And now I come back and I see you again and I have to know that you're the same person that you were the time before. And so uh, we had a lot of difficulty in writing that where you would uh, look at something and see it and then you'd turn and turn back and the unit would be duplicated or it would be in a slightly different location that had to be corrected. And we learned a lot in creating a mental model, but it's reasonably accurate now, but it's a ton of code to make, to, to correct for all of these potential small errors that creep into the process. Thank you so much, Charles, for that fantastic talk. So inspiring as well and uplifting. And I love your message that AGI is inevitable. Does everyone in the is there anyone in the does everyone in the August audience agree AGI is inevitable? Yeah, we do. <laughs> sure of hands.